So, not only do I think Mike is the kid who ran away, but I think this minigame single-handedly might be one of the most important and detailed things in the series. To start with when, I think this is after the bite victim has died already, at some unknown point in time ago, sometime before 1985, and sometime after 1983. So, why do I think this is after FNAF 4? Primarily, as we see in the Breaker Room, we know that the FNAF 4 gameplay and the FNAF 4 minigames are separate locations. And we know from that same Breaker Room image that if you go towards Fredbear's down the road, you have to take a left from the Afton's house. And Junior's is in the same relative location as Fredbear's would be. Not to mention, William has to drive away from Freddy's, which if it's this close, he shouldn't really need to do. Granted, scale is really inconsistent between the break room and FNAF minigames in general. I don't think the control room in Baby's Pizza World is the size of a house, but that's just me. So we're focusing more on shape and general location relative to the things around it. I think Junior's is some sort of bar or restaurant or some place that has a bouncer. Because otherwise, why would this guy be standing out perpetually in the rain not letting Orange Guy in? It doesn't make sense unless there was something he was specifically trying to keep out, which even if this was a pizzeria, its security guards don't just stand outside unless something's happened recently, which we have no reason to believe it is. Especially if this is the night Charlie dies. So I think Fred Bear's closed and reopened or was bought out as juniors. I feel Orange Guy is almost certainly William and a lot of theories that argue otherwise ignore a lot of context, particularly the connection to Security Puppet, where there's tire tracks going off the distance from Charlie's body connecting directly to FNAF 2 where William steps out of his purple car to kill Charlie. And also, William being drunk and banned from a bar and also being abusive just lines up a lot more. And plus, it will make a lot more sense as I go on. So if later that night refers to being the night Charlie dies and Junior's as Fred Bears, that places Charlie at Freddy's Zero, the same place that will later have the MCI. On the general topic, I think the between night scenes we see in FNAF 2 are the first nights after the MCI kids awaken in their new suits. Gabriel looking to his side to see Jeremy and Susie, and Cassidy slash whoever you think Golden Freddy is, it doesn't really matter for the sake of this theory. That's not really related to the rest of the theory, it just is proof that Charlie would hypothetically exist in the MCI location. And we have no proof the puppet ever existed in Fredbear's Family Diner. Continuing back to Midnight Motorists, it's established in this minigame that the runaway has been running away for a while. And I think these animatronic or bear or mascot footprints outside are a sort of scarecrow concept. A generic or potentially old reused parts and suits stood up there just to look and stare at Mike and keep surveillance sort of like second friend Fredbear. Though instead of being to watch or keep track of the bite victim and or communicate with him while William's busy working, this thing is just meant to scare him off or just watch him to make sure he doesn't run away again. I think Mike either moves out of the way, destroys it or knocks it over or does something to get rid of it because it creeps him out and also like I said it studies him and surveys him to keep track of where he's going. After he gets rid of it and William finds him running off, keep in mind he doesn't acknowledge the bear prints at all which implies to some level he does either doesn't notice them or doesn't care that they're there. And after William keeps up this abusive behavior, which is the reason Mike locked the door to not let him in to not hurt Mike or interact with Mike because he didn't want to be home where William's abusive, I think that that situation is what, if this is Miss Afton on the couch, drives her away. Whether she's divorced or just leaves or whatever, it doesn't matter. If it's Henry or a babysitter, I guess that's just an awkward night or something. It doesn't really matter that much. What does matter is I think that William moves Mike to a new room. Like I said, we know the FNAF 4 gameplay house is a separate location from the FNAF 4 minigame house. And in this house, Mike's room has two doors, neither of which can lock, that are placed on the opposite sides of the room. This way, he can't lock William out. He can't keep William out without having to run from one side to another. And there's no window for him to break to run out that way. William would always have a way to get inside, and Mike would have no easy way to leave. And around every corner, many plushies or things like Psychic Friend Fredbear, or even full-blown suits monitoring or watching him at all times. Not necessarily full-blown electronics, just basic things stood up around to keep track of him. And Mike's trauma of not being able to stop his dad from getting to him, desperately running from one side to another, knowing that there are these things always watching him and keeping track of his movements, manifests as the FNAF 4 gameplay. Years later, Mike has nightmares going back to his experience there. This is why stuff like the hospital equipment appears, as well as Nightmare Fredbear, being the main villain of his nightmare. It is his guilt of what he did, 
and it also is the impetus for him being put into this room in the first place. While I don't think William was ever a good father, I don't ever think he was this abusive until after Mike basically killed the bite victim. I think this whole thing is Mike merging his experience in FNAF 1 with his early life in his bedroom as a kid slash early teen. Which would explain why these things that are just props stood around to watch him are now trying to kill him in his dream. Not to mention, I think this living room in this house that the Amatrotter stood in that we can't really ever see in the gameplay but we know is there, is where Mike stays during the between night scenes of Sister Location when he's watching Immortal and the Wrestling. I think he still lives there, there just isn't a William to study or torment him this far into the timeline. And if you look back at the breaker room, we can see that the FNAF 4 gameplay house is right down the road from Circus Baby's Entertainment and Rental, which means he could walk to it just like we see in the cutscenes of Sister Location's Custom Night. While I'm not sure of the exact specific details or mechanics, we know from the gameplay of FNAF 4 that if you get rid of Freddy or Foxy, their plushies are left behind, and we know that William uses plushies to study and keep track of his kids. And we know from Nightmare of Fredbear, quote, this time there's more than just an illusion to fear. So there was some illusionary aspect to scare and keep track of Mike, but we also know from the survival logbook that his main experience with the nightmares is, well, nightmares. He tells Cassidy and or the activity book, whoever he's responding to in this page, that his dreams have Nightmare Fredbear in them. And if you're asking, wait, if they're not fully physical, if they're just illusions, how could the VR company know about them? Well, I think it's simple. Someone at the start of the survival logbook puts a post note saying, hey, you don't mind having a used book, do you? Which is specifically put there in response to Mike's name being there which implies some employee or company official has found or acquired this book at some point after Mike had it and after Mike drew in it. So all they need to do is find Mike's drawing of Nightmare Fredbear and they have the basis for him in VR. And presumably they could have found other drawings of Mike's related to the nightmares to fill out the rest of the roster or made their own characters inspired by the visuals of Nightmare Fredbear which would explain why the non-canon nightmare designs appear in FNAF Help Wanted. Another point you can make with all of this is that in the FNAF 4 minigames, we never see the bite victim interact with this separate building and house that the nightmares occur in, which gives him no clear time to ever experience them, because he dies at the end of that week in the hospital, or at least we assume it's the hospital. So he has no clear way to experience these events, but Mike does. In fact, we know Mike has, once again, because of the logbook. To me, Scarecrow Theory feels the most logical because otherwise you have just so many logical jumps that are even more absurd. That I, I know it's kind of weird to have the idea that Mike picks up this like faux animatronic blank suit outside and moves it. I know that sounds weird, but so many other theories are so many more levels of specific and absurd. There's the Twisted Ones theory, which requires that the Twisted Ones exist to walk outside the bite victim and or Mike's room to parade around for whatever reason that really doesn't have a good explanation for what they're really doing other than just scare the bite victim. And then you have other theories like, oh, it's Shadow or Golden Freddy luring someone to Freddy's or Fredbear's. But like, yeah, that does circumvent the teleporting thing where there's no foot trails, but it doesn't it really explain that if you think about it. Because like, if Golden Freddy or Shadow Freddy are teleporting there, that implies they're physical entities that can leave behind footprint. But then I guess they just have to teleport away after this kid breaks their window to follow this shadowy or a golden bear outside but the when they walk away the golden freddy or shadow freddy character doesn't leave footprints for that reason and the whole william luring a kid has that same problem like neither of those explain how they could interact with this window and just kind of teleport to have footprints there but not have footprints leaving or heading towards the window especially with the crowd that thinks the glass not being on the outside is the deciding factor that it's not a kid breaking a window. If the minigame is so precise that a lack of glass on the floor is a deliberate clue about what's going on, then how could you dismiss the footprints not going to the window and not leaving the area? It's just one set of footprints standing out there. Unless William is throwing a brick in the rain and the kid crawls out the broken window that way, and decides, yeah, this guy just threw a brick at me, I should follow them. What? How? And also, this implies that William can teleport or fly, I guess. I know absurdity really isn't a deciding factor in an argument, I just want to point out, remember what you're arguing before you try to debunk another theory? To me, this is one of the only explanations I can think of to why the footprints would be out there, but be a static set of footprints that aren't walking away or towards the window, and the thing that made them is just moved inexplicably. 
And if it's just a lightweight filler suit, it's basically rainproof, and also it would be light enough for Mike to move it. I swear, I've done the couch person rant almost every other video at this rate, so highlight reel. Gray is associated with more characters than just Mike. Mike isn't even always associated with gray. Characters use the prominent color in their design, and that's what makes their text color, so the gray text color doesn't even connect, and it's not even the same shade of gray as in FNAF 4. Not to mention, multiple characters can have the exact same color value and be separate characters. They speak very differently. Mike, with minimal exceptions, even when he's sad and depressed, doesn't talk this bluntly, and wouldn't talk to a drunk, abusive dad this way in the first place. It doesn't make sense for him to be this depressed or talk to William this way, especially if nothing bad's happened in their history at this point. Even more absurdly so if he's going to 180 to bully the bite victim during the night. And I know people say replay people are complicated and brothers can be mean or nice on a dime, but that evidence is anecdotal. It doesn't mean anything actually. It doesn't explain him being written like a separate character. Not to mention the fact that the gray goes all the way down to their legs in the couch person's right, which implies it's like a bathrobe or blanket or something like that. Or maybe even a nightgown. To me, this leaves only one real connection, which is the fact that couch person watches TV, which not only is not an exclusive Michael thing, it's not like Mike is the only character in all of fiction and FNAF who can watch TV. But I feel there is a case, with my crackhead absurd Miss Afton theory, that this could be her and still have a connection to TV. But for that, we're gonna have to enter the WHAT IS HE ON ABOUT ZONE! Remnant is a mixing of tangible with the intangible, of memory with the present, the people and things that are lost, it makes them real again. This is Phineas Taggart's definition of remnant in Fazbear Frights. And in the logbook, Cassidy keeps asking questions like, what do you remember? Do you remember your name? Are these familiar to you? To the altered text and or bite victim. So follow me on this. FNAF 4 connects to FNAF 3's Happiest Days. Almost everything we see in FNAF 4's minigames, the broken mangle toy, the toy chick on the ground, the kid with a red shirt, blue pants, and a pink balloon, the shadow of Bonnie on the wall, Fredbear walking off the stage as an employee, all of it links back to Happiest Day minigame. And those events connect to FNAF World as we set up all of those minigames in that game's clock ending. And almost every lore-based thing in FNAF World is related to the 8-bit minigame in our art style, including the flip side, which seems to have some otherworldly effect, as said by Fredbear, on FNAF World. So if we're setting up the bite victim's memories, which link to Happiest Day in FNAF World, and the 8-bit stuff is themed around that, if the flip side is related to memories and mindscapes and that would make Old Man Consequences area the lowest, deepest, and most hidden part of the bike victim's memories and consciousness. And by going to lake, you are burying yourself and drowning yourself in the deepest, most repressed and forgotten memory. Someone as a larger, older figure holding two younger gray figures in front of a flashing screen. A TV. I think this is showing us the crying child has basically all but forgotten his positive memories with his life. To borrow and expand upon a few ideas from Shatter Victim, I think the Bite Victim is literally broken in a soul-based sense. He has become an abstract spirit not really bonded to anything, and his good memories are so much more outshadowed and hidden away compared to his bad memories. Who he is has to be pieced together. And I think that's the point of Red Bear slash Adventure Freddy. He is a character created by Charlie to go through FNAF World and piece together things so the bite victim get its happiest day or help others get happiest day, whatever your interpretation is. Point is, digging through and finding those memories in the bite victim's traumatic life is part of the story. And one of those most ancient emotions and feelings was that sense of comfort alongside his mom and brother before his brother started being a dick. And I specifically think it's supposed to be both brothers, because why else have two gray figures? It could also explain why, in UCN, the drowning ending exists there in the first place and also links back to FNAF World. I think what we're seeing in UCN is Red Bear, who in this context represents Mike rather than just being Adventure Freddy, who has decided to move on or give up and just let William be tormented, drowning himself in one of his oldest memories, which is the same scene which I think is part of the importance of having both of them together. They both remember this moment. It is a positive memory for both of them. So either of them can access it, and either of them can get that achievement in FNAF World. But that's, like I said, a lot more of a crackhead reach theory. It's really abstract and weird. And now we are leaving the what is he on about zone. 
Let's talk about the mound and where the runaway are heading, because I do have some ideas for these. To be honest, where he's heading is the thing I'm least convinced on, but I feel like just context-wise, it feels like it should be Freddy's zero. And honestly, this is more of a hunch, not really based on evidence, but if he did run off to Freddy's zero, just because it's the main thing he could run off to in this context, and it would explain why he's not seen anywhere else in the minigame, why there's no footprints going anywhere else, it just vanishes, then I guess that means he either saw Charlie or just happened to be at Freddy's that night and saw the ensuing chaos, and maybe he could have even seen the puppet wrapped around her trying to protect her from the rain. It's a bit of a reach, but I think it would set up a lot for his character. In other words, finding Charlie dead makes him want to wonder who killed her and what happened. And seeing the puppet come to life later down the road, or maybe even on this night, is what leads him to investigating every pizzeria and studying the hauntings. This could even connect to my interpretation of Immortal and the Restless, which is built on this one line from the logbook where Mike says he relates to Clara because both of them notice how everything's absurd and no one takes them seriously. If we follow that train of logic, then we can explain the entirety of Immortal and the Restless is sort of a prequel to sister location. Mike is Clara, and Vlad is either Fazbear Entertainment as a whole or William specifically. Mike says at the end of sister location and custom night, it was right where William said it would all be. Which I think what Immortal Narcissus is conveying is that Mike kept pointing out the supernatural nonsense in all of Freddy's, and William kept denying it, saying he had nothing to do with it, that it's not even there, it's not even supernatural. Stuff like, oh, kids just get hyper and run around. The animatronics are just quirky and they just move around, don't worry about it. They're just trying to stuff you into a suit because they think you're an endoskeleton without its costume on. Stuff like that. But he's noticed it. He knows it's not just that. And I think eventually he gets William to slip up. And that's what gets him to go down to the event's assist location. Just like the end of Immortal and the Restless, Clara gets Vlad to slip and that cracks the connection. There isn't any literal baby. Oh, well, I guess there's... There kind of is, but not that kind of baby. It's not a dispute of whose child is whose. It's a dispute of responsibility. Who's responsible for what and what is real and what isn't. And that journey might start with him seeing the puppet walking around. And that would explain, before anything else, why he keeps going to Freddy's to study things and to tamper with the animatronics, to look at them, to try and figure out what's going on inside of them. The mound is something I have an idea for but it's really relying on the breaker room even more than the rest of this theory is so if we look at the breaker room map where the fnaf 4 house will be and where the surveillance room slash the secret room in the sister location are is loosely where the mound would be relative to fred bears slash juniors and the fnaf 4 minigame house slash the midnight motorist house Though do note that the scale of this map is all out of whack. It does not make any sense. Like I said earlier in the video, I'm looking more for these shapes and where things are relative to those shapes. The FNAF 4 gameplay house and the surveillance room are to the right of Fredbear's in the FNAF 4 house or up the road as it would be in the Midnight Motors map. And we know the surveillance bunker and in general the entire bunker facility has existed for a while, potentially way before any of the circus baby stuff was put in there. Fredbear and Spring Bonnie are still listed on the map despite the fact that we know the rental service was opened after Freddy's close, and Freddy's closes at least two years after Fredbear's closes. So we know the surveillance bunker exists way earlier. But there's no reason to think that the FNAF 4 house did, because we would see it right here. And that's not even me talking about the mound has to be surveillance bunk. In general, in this area, we should see the FNAF 4 house. But we never do, because I don't think it's been built yet. I think after the events of Midnight Motorist, that house is built. But wait, how would Afton have the money or time or resources to just build a house? Afton's f loaded. The entire point of Circus Babies was to capitalize on the success of Freddy's. I don't know where this idea that Freddy's was this failing, troubled brand ever came from, but it's never been implied that Freddy's prior to the murders, or Fredbears, had any trouble financially or popularity-wise. The only time Freddy's is ever portrayed as failing is in FNAF 1, years after all the murders and trauma and events have happened and no one trusts the brand anymore, and it's this rotting piece of building. And to cross them off the list, especially something that I said in my older videos, I don't think Mike is running off to the mound. I feel like there would have been footprints here if that was our takeaway we were supposed to get away from it. I know I didn't talk about every single counterpoint and alternative theory to this, but this video would go on forever if I took that route, so maybe I'll do a bonus video like with the original version of this theory. Oh, by the way, thanks for 10,000 subscribers, guys. Uh...